I'm John Anderson. Meet my co-host, Nate Best, and Hakeem Williams. We're going to have some amazing guests on the show. Buckle up tight, because we're going to be talking about the shit you're not supposed to be talking about. We're going to be discussing anything and everything it takes to become a legend of iron. Legend of Iron is brought to you by Muscle Man. The creator of Nitro Test. Nitro Test is hands down the most fucking kick-ass free workout on the market. The question is, can you fucking handle it? Welcome to another edition of Legends of Iron. With me always, my partners in crime, Nick Best and Akim Williams. I am John Anderson. We have got a killer show for you today. Yes, we do. We've got a guy who started off as a lawyer, very successful lawyer, I might add, and basically chose to quit that job to become a bodybuilder and, and basically kind of take his what take what he does into the fitness industry. And what he does is quite interesting. As he puts it, he is pioneering human evolution through chemistry. Tony Huge, my brother, welcome to the show. How are you? Hello, my friends of freedom. <laughs> thanks for What's coming on up? i i appreciate you all right good to talk to you guys so you're in thailand it's 6 30 in the morning right now so we thank you for getting breaking your normal schedule and getting up early for us thank you very much brother much appreciated all right <laughs> thank you <laughs> yes. yeah well i gotta tell you one thing that is always really kind of I've always was thought was very interesting about you. You're very smart. Clearly, you're a lawyer, but you had a successful career as a lawyer, and you chose just to give it up and take a turn. So talk to us about that. That's pretty interesting stuff. I, I felt like a pretty big fish uh, in a small pond, you know, in Sacramento as a lawyer. And then I went to uh, Asia and when I was 30 years old and opened up my mind about the rest of the world. I traveled to Mexico many times and you know, I traveled within America a lot, but going to Asia was just like going to a different galaxy. And I realized the world was so big and there was so much I wanted to, to see that, that kind of, that fit my lifestyle and preferences more. <laughs> like I felt like it felt right. Uh, so that, that was part of it. And then the other part of it was baby mama. My, uh, I was with, a, I was dating a lot of different women at the same time. And one of them decided to get pregnant to try to trap me. And uh, as a lawyer, <laughs> I, I ran the math on what I would have to pay in child support and, and how, you know, how that would impact my life. And I said, uh, I'd rather retire. Uh, so <laughs> that, those are a couple. Of, the other reason is I built a law firm up to about, there was about 22 employees I had. So it was a pretty wow. big law firm. That's pretty substantial. Extremely yeah. stressful, just like way beyond and then when I, I thought, okay, that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to keep growing and growing and, you know, the stress comes along with it. And my passion is bodybuilding, right? And, and, and biohacking, chemistry, just manipulating the human body, I guess, is my ultimate passion. I think bodybuilding is one of the most fun ways to do that. So uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was good timing from those three different elements to make a complete 180 and go to a totally different direction. <laughs> yeah, wow. I imagine. Yeah, I imagine. Hey, one of our one of our hosts here, uh, Nick. He can only do this for a little while. So, I'm Nick. If you got any questions, I'm gonna let you jump in early because I usually take up too much time in the front of the show. So, you got a question? Fire away, brother. All right. So, like with biohacking and stuff like that, can you explain that to the listeners, kind of more what that is? Because I went and had stem cells, and that was amazing. I cannot believe the difference that it made for me because it cut my walking around pain in half. And so I'm just wondering what else there is that's out there. Great question. Yeah. The way I look at it is if you took at every element of your life, every thing that you do, every feeling you feel, everything you experience, everything can be enhanced. Huh, see enhanced. <laughs> so <laughs> okay. you know, there's a lot of ways to do it. You can, you can enhance something through mindset. Um, you can enhance something, you know, using something like technology, or you can do it through chemistry. And since our bodies and our minds, everything just runs off 
chemistry. It's like you can really manipulate every element of our life with chemistry. And I, it's so my underlying value is the medical freedom to be able to manipulate our body. Like I, I find it so offensive that the government would interfere with our ability to decide to do with what we want with our own bodies and our lives. Yeah. And bodybuilding is such a great gateway to, to teach people that because once people realize that all the athletes are using something to give them a chemical advantage and, and once you kind of put your pinky toe in the pool, you want to put your whole foot and you want to jump in the pool when it comes to chemistry, <laughs> when it comes to bodybuilding. And if done right, like bodybuilding chemistry is not that unhealthy. I mean, the benefits Sure. Okay. There's risks with it, but the benefits are up here. It's amazing if it's done right. So if, if I could teach people how to use chemistry to, to improve their quality of life through bodybuilding, then it opens up their mind to everything else. And uh, then they'd start questioning everything they thought they knew about chemistry and Western medicine and what's good or what's bad about chemistry and dropping the taboos and just looking at, Hey, how can this stuff improve my quality of life yeah so so everything like you're asking like stem yeah, cells yeah. one thing you can do so it's literally yeah. everything so sleep sex uh just the way you, how your brain works um you know your 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 physical strength in the gym stamina muscle building uh yeah everything on that level, brother, what would you say with all of your experimentation because we're going to go into you experimenting later what would it be in terms of on this topic? What's the one thing that you would say stands out in your mind in terms of in terms of enhancing you on one of these levels that you just mentioned, which there are many? Or top three. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, I think about that. <laughs> I, I come across a drug and I'm just like, wow, I can't imagine life without this drug. It's life is so much better with this drug. And there's so many drugs and I haven't even experiment experienced them all. You know, most, so what most are the top three? What are the top three? We're dying to know, brother. <laughs> I think most bodybuilders would say testosterone, right? If you had to pick one drug you could do, it'd be testosterone because that kind of covers all your bases in, in bodybuilding. You know, that's a foundation. Um, I, I'd say from a, a sleep, anti-anxiety, quality of life and, and feeling good perspective, I'd say Zyrem, which is the, that's the prescription name of GHB. That would be in the top three. Yeah. And uh, okay. maybe I'd pick, maybe I'd pick like Xyrem, marijuana and um, testosterone as a foundation. Not the testosterone is my favorite steroid. It's just that you had to pick one. You want to pick yeah. one that kind of covers all the bases. Talk to us about the GHB. I mean, obviously there's, you know, we, we understand how people use it to party, but you're using things at a different level. You're doing it to enhance good quality of life not to go out on the weekend so talk to us about ghb and how that actually fits into your equation yeah so so ghb got a bad name as the date rape drug but i, I don't i actually don't think it was ever used for that any more than alcohol that's for sure i mean alcohol is a date rape drug but, and that's fine that's part of i think it's part of human evolution i think I think the human species evolved, you know, to work with alcohol, <laughs> but that doesn't mean that alcohol is the best drug. Like for all the reasons that people want to use alcohol, GHB is so much better with less side effects, no withdrawals if responsibly used, uh, no dehydration, no toxicity, actually improves quality of sleep instead of decreases quality of sleep. It lasts about four hours. So you can get in four hours the same amount of value from sleep as if you slept nine hours. So if someone wanted really? to be extremely efficient, you know, they could take this and sleep for four hours and, and save an extra five hours per day that they could use towards something else. I think the ultimate schedule would be use it to sleep every time four hours, twice per day. If you're, you know, highly physically active and highly mentally active, then you need sleep. Right. But those eight hours would be like the benefit of sleeping, you know, 12, 13, 14 hours, sleep much deeper, much faster, no wasted time in bed in, in states of sleep that aren't highly productive. Cause if you, if you, there's a big difference between sleeping where you're just sleeping a little bit and you're just kind of resting your mind and sometimes you don't know you could be your sleep quality oh, yeah. could really suck and you think you're sleeping 
And maybe you feel crappy the next day, but it's a lot more than just that. Like your whole body's not rested. Yeah. So people heal and people prevent disease and uh, people just feel better and accomplish more when they get really good sleep. And there's nothing that provides better sleep than like, there's a lot of different sleeping medications to be like, Oh, this didn't work for me. That didn't work for me. I've never met anybody that G didn't work for. And so I'm glad it was a recreational drug. And uh, then it became a prescription drug not that long ago. And I was like, as soon as I found out it was became a prescription drug, I went and got a prescription. Not easy to get a prescription for. That's why a couple of reasons I don't talk about it more, even though it's one of my top three out of thousands of, of chemicals is because it's not that easy to get a prescription for. You kind of have to have a doctor that's a friend that's willing to take a little bit of risk because with these type of chemicals, yeah, they do have a risk if you overdose and your heart stops or something. I mean, people have- Yeah, that's bad. I don't know. Yeah. Then the doctor, <laughs> the doctor's going to get a lawsuit. Yeah. Hey, real quick, Tony, I got a- Oh, I'm sorry, Nick. I thought you were saying you had to go. If you got another question, well, you're going to stick it out a little more. Let's I do go, man. I do got to go, but I got a question. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you talk about going to sleep twice for four hours in a day. How would you space that out? Well, it's it's really so, hard with you know modern world and a nine to five type of schedule and 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 all that. But if if I was building the ultimate sleep protocol, you know, I, I'd sleep four hours at night and four hours in the afternoon, mm. and and just you know however much time that is in between. So midnight to 4 a.m. and then say yeah. like 2 to 6? Yeah, exactly. Or one, 1 to 5, something like that? Yeah, exactly. Okay, okay. Interesting. Um, interesting. I'm going to have I mean, to look at that. A lot of other parts of the world, you know, they you know they do take naps in the afternoon. That's part of, that's been a yeah. part of, for, for you know, it's been a part of their civilization. So it's makes oh, a lot of sense. Do you guys take naps? Do you guys ever nap? I like to, uh, just unfortunately, really the schedule much. doesn't always permit me to, you know. So, so that when, I, when I'm prepping for a, a competition, sometimes I don't yeah. have to do that. Yeah. yeah. It can help so much because, like, your your hunt, your appetite, for example, you got to control your appetite for a competition. Mm-hmm. You know, when you get tired, your willpower to stick to the diet is yeah, a little worse. Yeah. You get yeah. hungry. Yeah. You take a nap. <laughs> you wake up refreshed. You don't need to eat. Yeah. You know, you don't feel like eating in the morning, right? So mm-hmm. you have two mornings that you don't need to eat. You just feel productive and you have energy. So, yeah, it's really yeah. awesome. That's, awesome. that's awesome. crazy. Right. That's really good information, brother. You know? I, 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 think, I think Nick, Nick, Nick is going to put that on his to-do list, man. Yeah. <laughs> I'm putting that on my to-do list. And unfortunately, <laughs> I got a bolt. Yeah, uh, right on, brother. I so want to be part of this and listen to more of this. I got a bazillion questions to ask. Well, just so you, Nick, just so you know, Tony is definitely a two-part guy, so we're going to have to get him on a okay. second episode for sure. So, <laughs> cool. well, Tony, I'm going to write down a list of stuff I got to ask you questions about because this is fascinating, and this is yeah. the type of stuff I really want to get into. But yeah. unfortunately, I got to run. Yeah, do your so thing, you guys. Brother. Have a great day. All you right, take it, it easy. Right on. So that's really interesting, Tony, that GHB, I mean, obviously my, my own personal perception was completely skewed. I imagine most people's uh, just like myself. What about you, Ock? Did you have the same idea that I did, that it was just kind of a party drug? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, always, that's what I've always known it as, you know. And I, I didn't wow. know you could just use it to the benefit of getting good night's sleep and stuff like that. You know, I could have yeah. replaced it with my ZMA. <laughs> so you said tes- you said testosterone you said uh ghb and what was the last one was it was it marijuana marijuana yeah, yeah. okay so how do how does that one tell us you what would be your protocol for uh for use of marijuana in terms of being productive well i'd start with what not to do with it which is to be be on it all the time <laughs> yeah if, okay if you're on it all the time and that becomes your reality I, I do think productivity goes down. I think, you know, it kind of shifts your perspective of, of reality and uh, interferes with memory. So just like any drug, if you use it responsibly and mm-hmm. not all the time and don't build up a tolerance, then it's amazing. So I think one of the most important things we can do uh, for quality of life and to make, be able to make good decisions is to shift our perspective. 
You know, you're yes. looking at your life and, and a problem through a narrow lens. And if you can broaden that and see your life or your decision that you think about making from a different angle, you have so much more information then to make a good decision and creativity goes way up. For me, gratitude goes up. So marijuana makes me really appreciative of everything. So sometimes I can, Interesting. I don't, I don't say negative things. And most of the people around me say I'm one of the most positive people I ever met, but you know, I have the dark side in my, my head. That's kind of complaining about things, the voice in my head and uh, sees the pessimistic side of things. And I don't like that. And marijuana just makes me feel optimistic and positive and see the, the silver lining in things. And, you know, the, the Buddhist, the Buddhist saying to accept what you can't change and focus your energy on what you can change. Uh, marijuana really helps me do that. Uh, and then also it's just a quality of life, feel good thing at night. You know, if you have a really stressful day, it's a way to relax it, For me, it doesn't interfere with sleep. It helps my sleep and uh, everything feels better on it. I mean, sex on to me, sex on marijuana is so good because it feels sort of new. Like if I have sex without marijuana, it feels sort of repetitive. Like, and then if I'm on marijuana, it feels like the new feeling again. Like the first time, if you think back to the first time you had sex, especially if it's <laughs> new and exciting. You can, yeah, if you can redo your first time every time with a little weed, I think anybody's going to be in favor of that. <laughs> yeah. But not um, everybody has not everybody has an amazing experience with these drugs the first yes, time. It takes experimentation. Totally. So, you know, for me to say I love G, and then someone goes out and has G and they have too much and they pass out and they or they throw up or something, they're gonna be like, Oh, this is a terrible drug. Yeah. Well, because you have to approach all these drugs carefully. And I, every day, anytime yeah. I try a new drug drug, I start with a really low dosage to the point I can't even feel it. That's just a yeah. safety test, tolerance yeah. test. And then I yeah. increase the dosage very slowly, mm. very, every time I use it, just a little bit more. And then I do want to feel the, what an overdose feels like. Then I do push it to the limit. <laughs> understanding that I don't always want to go there, but I need to know where that threshold is. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. you're obviously your sweet spots, what you're looking for, but you want to know what a little too yeah. little is and a little too much is. And if you can document those points, you can get to your sweet spot a lot more efficiently. Yes. Yes. So, yeah. so this, my perspective on this has completely changed. I mean, when I was, when I was a, a lawyer, I was extremely anti-drugs. I mean, I, I was to the point where I didn't publicly say this, but I felt the world would be better off if we just gathered all the people who did drugs together and executed them. And then the world would be a more productive place. You know? <laughs> what, a, what, a, what a change of perspective, my brother. Holy smoke. Yeah. <laughs> well, he, he's, he's, on, he's on the other side of the fence now. That's why. Yeah. And, and part of what I think I'm doing is trying to, to raise awareness for this other perspective of using drugs to enhance our quality of life when used responsibly. Because I had a girlfriend that was doing marijuana and benzodiazepines when, when I was younger. And I, I abused her verbally and emotionally so much for it because I thought that was the right thing. I thought I had to fix her. And yeah. uh, later, I, later now I understand and I'm so, I, I feel so remorseful for it. I want to go back and apologize to her about it. And it's like part of the reason I want to be an advocate for drugs, the responsible use of drugs is to make up for the maybe the damage I did to some people in society being so anti-drugs before. And when I talk to people that are anti-drugs, I totally understand the perspective. Like I wasn't always a advocate of drugs. I was against drugs. So now when I talk to someone and they say something like against drugs, drugs are bad, natural this and natural that. I'm like, okay, I totally get what you're coming from. You know, if you spend enough time with me, you will join me on the other side of the fence. You know, you, it's, it's a matter of information. You don't have the information or experience yet like I didn't back then. Yeah. yeah. You know, one of the things that <clears throat> obviously you've kind of touched on a little bit with experimenting with, say, a new drug and finding out the right amount that makes it good for you and productivity. Talk to us a little bit about it. I mean, you've, you're very open with, you know, basically experimenting on yourself, uh, you know, which obviously far better <laughs> to do it to yourself than somebody else. So, <laughs> you know, but uh, 
Talk to us about if you had to say of all the experiments that you've done, <clears throat> obviously I'm sure there's multiple different types of drugs you experimented with. What was the biggest breakthrough moment when you, with a, an experimentation of say something new or manipulating the body, like in your mind, what's that? Holy shit. Look at this. So because I was so anti-marijuana, like that was the drug I thought was the worst. I thought, I thought that, you know, my dad was extremely anti-drugs. My dad wouldn't even drink alcohol, right? So I, I got some of that from him. And my mom was all, all about natural everything, anti-Western medicine. Uh, you know, she saw pharmaceutical drugs the same as recreational drugs. Drugs are drugs, drugs are bad, right? So that's how I was raised. Yeah, so there was a lot of epiphanies along the way where I went, wow, drugs aren't that bad. Wow, drugs could be extremely helpful. I think... Uh, one, one that kind of shocked me was melanotan to be able to inject myself with a peptide that at the time I couldn't find any side effects. I still have had never had a side effect from it. That's relevant. So, so can you just for the listeners kind of explain what that is and what it's supposed to do? Yeah, it's a, it's a peptide injected with just a little insulin needle, like, like this, just I that one's just, handy right there. <laughs> yeah. One tiny little drop of insulin needle on an insulin needle. And then my skin color gets darker. See, like I, I like to have the darker skin because the shadows on the muscles look better, right? Like just like yeah. bodybuilding stage. Yeah. Uh, and to me, I always felt like tan skin is like healthy. Uh, it's funny because I'm in an, I'm I'm in Asia right now where everybody wants to have the whitest skin possible. <laughs> it's uh, not a racist thing. Like if you're black, you know, it's not like they would think that a black person would become white. It's just that in their culture, like if you have tan skin, that means you like you're a laborer, like you work outside. Oh, yeah. Uh, outside. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, so it's, a, lot, it's, a, it's a lot like that in, in a lot of different countries. Like I just came back from India and I, I think it's pretty much the same way over there, too. Yeah. You know, but if you're black, skin. they say, OK, they're, yeah. you're, that's your genetics. It's not like yeah. doesn't mean you're a laborer. You could yeah. be royalty and you're still going to yeah. be black. So it's not like that. It's, it's not. It's like a color based on class system type of thing. Yeah. So they're always putting stuff to whiten their skin. And, and you can actually inject something, glutathione, you know, which also is to detox the liver and antioxidant. That makes your skin white. I did that. and I did too much of it. And I turned out really white also. So here we can inject ourselves with glutathione, make ourselves white. We can inject ourselves with melanotan and make ourselves tan without, you know, worrying about the sun one way or the other. Don't have to like go in the sun to tan or avoid the sun to stay white. Now we can just do a little injection either way. And it's not unhealthy. It's they they still they're still trying to find side effects from it, but we're still not seeing any long term side effects. So that's that's pretty interesting. So it's just, <clears throat> and how long have you been doing it, and you've had no side effect? Melanotan was the first thing that I ever had voluntarily injected in me, besides in a doctor's office, and that was I'm 39. I think I was probably around 20. 26 or something like that. So I, I started steroids when I was 30. And so long before I ever did steroids, I did melanotan. Yeah. So that's a long time I've been using it. And, and obviously I'm not like you think, okay, if I use it that long, why am I not black? You could turn yourself <laughs> black. But... <laughs> <laughs> I, I have friends i have friends that their skin is black from melanotin you can do it right the, really? uh, but it's all a matter of how you how much you take so if i just take like a little bit of maintenance like a tiny little amount like that every once in a while it just keeps me tan you know if i were taking like a lot of like that all the time and i was going in the sun i would be black so you can kind of choose your skin color it's, it's, it's kind of interesting you know because you're talking about a drug like that and yet they say the tanning beds are so bad for you, but they don't do yeah. more research into something like that, right? I I used I I had a phase where I was doing the tanning beds, and then I had this mm -hmm. friend that got skin cancer from the tanning bed, and See? it was really bad. It's a life or death. Mm -hmm. Skin cancers can be really bad. You have to mm -hmm. catch it early. You have to get it burned off, otherwise it can grow and spread, right? So, but I got really nervous because. This person was like an advocate for the tanning bed. They were like, yeah, tanning bed's great. It's healthy. And then boom, skin cancer. <laughs> I'm like, there's got to be a better way. I don't want to end up yeah. like that. So melanotan is much safer. So, so, so even, even the people who try to, you know, get rid of this chemistry, our availability of this chemistry, 
mm-hmm. they'll try to say, oh, the potential side effects of melanotan. Well, mm-hmm. the potential side effects that we haven't seen of melanotan compared to the certain, absolute certain side effects of overusing a tanning bed and getting skin cancer, I'll yeah. choose the possibility of maybe some possible side effect 20 years from now over the definite side effect of skin cancer, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's very true. I mean, I had a tanning bed in my garage for years, and then obviously you get a little older, you see what it does to your skin, you think, you know, th- this this trend has got to stop. I'm not lucky enough I didn't have any skin cancer, but you start looking like a goddamn raisin, you think, Jesus Christ, I'm only 35, and I'm, I can, I'm looking weathered. If I do this my whole life, you know, forget about it. So, I, I had a flashback of, a, I had a tanning bed in my house, too. I got it specifically because I thought, okay, if I have a tanning bed, all the girls will want to come over and <laughs> get naked to use my tanning bed, and they'll already be naked. So, <laughs> how, how did that work? How did that work out? There, not a lot came over, but some did. Uh, I mean, actually, <laughs> I don't know if it was worth the expense and the space. Yeah, yeah. But but you, you, it's, it's, you, you have some trial and error. It's trial and error, baby. You know. <laughs> I love it. Okay, uh, brother. You, so you, you, John, can you imagine that? Can you imagine that as a pickup line? Yeah, I got a tan, but you want to come over? <laughs> <laughs> That's good yeah. stuff, though. Actually, sometimes, like, if a girl really likes you, then you just need an excuse not to make it awkward to come to your house, right? So, yeah. Yeah, yeah very so, true. So maybe it wouldn't convince the girl who's not going to come over, but for the girls who do want to come over, it's nice to have something to give them. Yeah. Like, Use, yeah, a nice, easy way to come over. Yeah, you must catch a tan. Hopefully, there's more to it, but you know, we'll start off with the tan. You know, <laughs> maybe maybe they'll ask me is is that is that surveillance camera on? No, 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 that's not recording. <laughs> no, it definitely not. Yeah, why is why is that camera positioned right at the base of the tanning bed? Why is it there? <laughs> uh, okay, brother. So you this is, you gave us a <clears throat> the one side of the fence. Melanotan, forgive me if I pronounced that wrong. Let's go to the other side of the fence. What's been what's been uh, an experimentation that that went the wrong direction? Talk to us about the worst one. I mean, there's a lot of them. So there's a lot of ones that that got me excited about chemistry and changed my mind about chemistry. Marijuana was another one. But then what went really bad that uh, was when I was injecting site enhancement, hyaluronic acid, uh, derma filler you know, like synthol type approach. And they they use a chemical in it to create a reaction that causes the molecules to chain together so that they last much, much longer in the muscle. So you can inject it once every six months instead of once every three days. It's called cross-linking. So they put this chemical in like BDDO or there's a bunch of different chemicals they can use and they have to put the chemical in, cross-link it and then pull the chemical out. Well, this manufacturer didn't pull the chemical out. So it still had this cross-linking chemical in it. I mean, I, that, nobody told me that. I just know from my research that that's what, what happened. So we inject this and I mean, it feels like you're gonna die for days. It's, it's very toxic to the body. So, wow. you know, what's interesting- when you say is you some, feel like you're gonna die, like, I mean, it just made you feel terrible. Yeah, your whole body's aching with inflammation and you just feel sick and just lay in bed and drink a lot of water and try to flush it out. Oof. Yeah, that doesn't sound very pleasing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is one of the type of things where you buy, you know, you buy it from China because that's where everything's made. And a lot of times you buy stuff from China, raw powders, whatever, everything's fine. Everything's great. And once in a while you get something that goes really bad. So then you're reminded that, oh yeah, that's what that whole you know, people like made in the USA, not made in China type thing. <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> well, I'm going to shift gears a little bit because I've seen, I've seen more than one female cross behind you in the, in the camera there. So let's, let's kind of, <clears throat> let's change gears to, you know, your position, uh, you know, how you live your life in terms of relationships. That's probably the most interesting, unique thing about, yeah. And uh, I think that I think the way I deal with relationships is part like I took this approach where I'm just going to do what I want without regard with what society thinks about it. So like Mm -hmm. and I uh, I just in America, I had 
I had one girl, I would have one girlfriend and then just like drama and fighting and, or the girl didn't want to do what I wanted to do. Or I felt like, okay, she's a 10 in some ways, but she really sucks in other ways. So I'm kind of settling. So I thought, okay, maybe I need more than one girlfriend. And that evolved into as a lawyer, I would have seven girlfriends. So there was a different girlfriend for every night and not every girl is okay with this. Right. But you're dating and you figure out who's okay with what, uh-huh. And, I, and as a lawyer, I was really busy and the girls valued my time so much that they were okay mm-hmm. with one day per week. Plus it made me work really hard to please them. So I'm like, okay, gotcha. I know I'm not going to spend a lot of time with them. So I have to make sure the time they're with me has to be spectacular. That, that's what I was going to tell you. I was going to ask you that get expensive really fast. <laughs> Well, I didn't have a lot of time. Expensive. Yeah. Okay. Later it does. The girls are good. (laughs) Now I realize Mm -hmm. like in Thailand, when I pay $30 for a girl, Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, wow, I saved so much money because Mm -hmm. if not, and it becomes a girlfriend, it's going to cost me way more later. And a lot of people understand that. Yeah. 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 So so backing up, backing up just so the viewers know in America, these were, these were females that were coming because they're interested in you. You weren't paying them to come over every night or were they, were they pay to order females? No, I wasn't paying for girls in the U S I, I mean, I did, I did start using Craigslist and, and all that to fill some gaps, <laughs> you know, but uh, then they took that, they took that section off of Craigslist and it got a little bit harder and then it went to back page. So yeah, I explored that a little bit, but the girls in the U S that are for hire, they're either extremely expensive and 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 they look good, but they also don't have, they're also not really giving you the girlfriend experience. You know, it's still just kind of like a job or they're, they're not that good and they're less expensive, but um, you know, like pretty trashy. So that's okay. That's okay. Sometimes I like to party with that every once in a while back then, but not like a regular (laughs) A regular thing. But in Thailand, it's different. In Thailand, the Yeah, I was going to say, I want to hear about Thailand. I've heard you talk about that in the past. And so now we're kind of going to the current current life of Tony Huge with, with the ladies, correct? Yeah. So back then, it was a different girl every night. And some of them and some of them make a lot of money. And some of them, heck, they, they spoil me. And some of them, I they don't have less money. So I spoil them. So had nothing to do with money, just, just dating. And then fast forward to Thailand my dream was to have a polygamous relationship where I have me and two other girls or, or more, but I think two is all I can really handle uh, full time and everybody lives together and everybody's a team. And that way I get my variety and I don't feel pressure on satisfying them because hopefully they both have some lesbian in them too. So they satisfy each other. (laughs) But then you know, dealing with women's emotions, you know, dealing with one woman's emotion, even, you know, you're married and, and you learn that you learn that woman you've worked with, you still got to deal with these emotional when she's on her period or, or menopause, or just the women's mind is so emotional. They think less logical. So like, imagine dealing with a whole bunch of those all at the same time that have girlfriend mm-hmm. status. So I, that's what I'm always dealing with. So, so this right here, this was baby mama one. This is the one that traps me. And I'm still with her, right? I, I, I always loved her. I loved her before she got pregnant. I wanted to be mm-hmm. with her, but I, I, it kind of was a betrayal of my trust that she, that she did that. That's something we get over. There's a lot of things I'm sure I did that betrayed her trust. So working through it as a relationship, but she doesn't really want to be in a polygamous relationship. So what I have to do is I have to be with her. And then separate from that, I have other you know, like threesome relationships. So I'm juggling a lot of stuff here, but in Thailand, it's a lot easier. (laughs) But it's something that you're, it's a, it's a choice to juggle. It's not like you're being forced to juggle. This is what you chose to do. This is what you want. Life would be so much more simple for me. If I could just be with one woman, it would be, it would be cheaper. It would be more peaceful, but I just get bored so fast. I start getting resentful. I start feeling trapped. So, so I guess my deepest value is freedom. And when I'm with one woman, I start feeling trapped. I start feeling caged. I start feeling suffocated. So it's like, I I need, 
I just need something to feel like I have my freedom. Maybe that's from some trauma from really bad young relationships when I'm younger. So maybe I could fix that psychologically to be with one woman, but then like, I just don't want to, because it's also so much fun to go with, you know, a different girl that might have something to offer that my main girl doesn't have to offer. And then just be really open about it, really honest about it. So that like no girl can get mad about me being dishonest because it's like right in their face. I mean, YouTube, yeah. Instagram, public, yeah. everybody yeah. knows yeah. this is how I am. Yeah. So they have to accept it. Not every girl accepts it. I just went on a date the other night with a with a really nice, sweet, normal girl, not a working girl. I because I, I like dating working girls too, like professional, yeah. professional satisfying girls. <laughs> but <laughs> this one, I opened my motorbike. And my, I've got a Hello Kitty helmet inside my motorbike, and we're going back to her room, and I and I open the motorbike thing, and she sees the Hello Kitty helmet, and because this is about the time, like right before we have sex, that I start explaining more about who I am. I thought, by, I thought she would have known by my social media. Usually they do, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and uh, she sees the Hello Kitty helmet, so that sparks the conversation of, oh yeah, also upstairs is my baby mama and my seven year old daughter, and mm-hmm. all that, and then that was too much for her. Right. Mm. So before we had sex, I, I told her, but it was too much for her. So that kind of weeded her out. So mm. I weed out the ones that are not OK with it. And the girls mm. that I do end up with are are OK with this kind of uh, this yeah. kind of relationship. So just to no, clarify, you, you, who's in who's in like you, your house who you're in right now, who resides there? Just so everybody's clear. So it's it's, it's constantly changing as of this <laughs> moment. Baby mama one is with me. My daughter, baby Callie, is is staying the night last night at uh, my stepdaughter's house. My stepdaughter's 19 years old from America, just moved over here to Thailand also. She has her own condo, so her daughter's staying over there. Um, that allows us, you know, having our daughter go there allows baby mama one and I to party and, and be adults, you know. And then downstairs in the same building is my other girlfriend. We call her cat lady. So like I go down to her unit and spend time with her alone. And then she comes up here to spend time together, but not to have sex together because baby mama one and her don't get along sexually. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. So I have to have sex with them individually, but both of them like threesomes. So I'll go down to the, ba- I'll go to cat lady and, and we'll have threesomes with other girls. And then I'll come up and baby mama one and I will have threesomes with other girls <laughs> separately. And then so just the baby mama one and cat don't like to get together. That's, that's the, that's the block. Okay. Right. Right. There's jealous. They're je- jealous because they're jealous because cat lady was first priority before I brought baby mama one over. So she's right. not, she doesn't like to be now pushed to feel like she's second priority. And why is she mama, cat lady? Why is she named cat lady? I got to know that. What's, what's, why oh, she's just she get the name cat, cat lady? She's oh, obsessed okay. with cats. She's just, everything about her is all about cats. And and then the other, my longtime girlfriend here, she I've been with her for a year. And then my longtime girlfriend here for three years is named nicknamed Werewolf because when she drinks alcohol, she gets pretty aggressive and, and crazy. <laughs> so baby mama one and werewolf get along together and they're always hanging out. So werewolf is always over here. And, and so how did werewolf kind of, get her name? Uh, uh, alcohol, got, alcohol. Yeah, she drinks the alcohol and then she gets pretty aggressive and she knows. <laughs> <I'm not. laughs> and I've got this door in my condo that is like the solid wood door that's impenetrable. I mean, I could not break this door down if my life depended on it. And yet she almost broke this door down uh, because she thought I was inside with another girl and there's claw marks literally her her fingernails have claw marks in the door like something out of a movie so that's where the and, werewolf and you could you could hear her where you're obviously you could hear her trying to get through the door when what is that correct what, yeah. what are you thinking when you hear this fear for my life <laughs> <laughs> you're thinking son of a bitch that door better hold up huh yeah <laughs> Remember when we had these lockdowns in Thailand, we had these lockdowns for, you know, the, the virus stuff. And I was stuck with her. Like this is, this is a hard thing in Thailand. Most people live in very small condos. So Mm -hmm. imagine like you're stuck in the condo on a lockdown with a person you're in a relationship with, which you normally don't spend that much time alone with and you're stuck. Mm -hmm. 
because in, in Thailand, like a lot of the rest of the world, you don't spend that much time in your home. You, you're home and you, like, you sleep there and then everything else you do outside. So now all of a sudden you're forced to be in this little condo with someone and it, it caused a lot of interesting, like a lot of people broke up with each other as soon as they got out of lockdown. That's for sure. I mean, how do you wake up with someone when you have lockdown? How are you going to find another mate? You know, otherwise you're yeah. going to be alone during lockdown, right? That's very true. true. Yeah. Very true. So Thailand, why Thailand? <clears throat> Obviously, there's a whole lot of, we've been talking about some of the elements, just the, the culture of females, but there's probably, no you, there's probably a multitude of reasons. You seem to, you, you always have multiple reasons behind your choice making, it seems. Yeah, the feeling of freedom is number one. I mean, it is a military dictatorship. You know, there is, this is not really a democracy in Thailand. So mm -hmm. you'd think that there'd be a lot less freedom. But just like Vietnam also is a, is a communist country, there's actually more freedom in the U.S. It's just because the government doesn't feel the need to interfere with every little thing in your daily life. So you, as long as you're not pissing off the government, you actually have a lot of freedom. And then money, the way that the, the, some of these countries like Thailand, there's a lot of countries like this work, is if you have a little bit of money, you can buy your way out of anything. And that's, it's just uh, separated. It's like you have the high society, the people have money, the people who don't, the people who don't are kind of like slaves for the people who do. And that's just how it is. It's a class system. And yeah. as a foreigner, you come to Thailand, you don't really fit in the class system, which is amazing. You uh -huh. can kind of go to high society, you can kind of hang out with peasants, and you can get the best of both. And personally, I like hanging out with the low, like the not the high society people because they have more fun. You know, and uh, brother, I, I got a. We have a vacation house in Mexico, and I'm just. I mean, when we go out to dinner, I like going to the little places where it's just you know, it's a family running it, run this little restaurant. I mean, it's like I know what you mean. There's the different classes, the the lower there. There's a lot more. I mean, talk about just being a down to earth person because you strip away all of the shit that we think is necessary, which is really not. They're looking at what life is really about, which is supporting themselves and feeding their kids and <clears throat> it's a much different experience yeah it's so real so i like hanging out with the lower side of society but i like to have the power of the higher society uh, so that it's yeah. so that i have the most amount of freedom so that's yeah, yeah. you can do that in thailand and many many other countries america mm -hmm. is more of the unique is more of the rare style of of country so that's i could have gone any i could have gone a lot of places for that the other thing in Thailand is the infrastructure, like the internet is, uh, I think it's rated the fastest internet in the world. So like my cell phone internet really? is, is insanely fast and reliable. No and you can actually run, you can run your whole entire house internet off of just one cell phone. That's how fast it is. But isn't wow. it crazy how in modern day society, especially in America, your speed of Wi-Fi is almost some sort of status. It's fucking crazy. You know, we just got the Starlink from Elon Musk and everybody in the neighborhood is like, oh, my God, 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 God. you know, it's like, oh, we got fast Internet. Like that's some sort of a status symbol. <laughs> but I mean, I swear to God, it's really goofy. I mean, it's like, you know, having fast Internet makes it it puts you you're connected to things faster. And, in, yeah. you know, the way that we live now, everything's got to be fast. So. Internet is one of those things. Having a fast internet connection, it's crazy how people get turned on by this. It's it's when, when nice. I have slow internet, it feels like mm -hmm. being in traffic. You know, you go to work and yeah. an hour to go, what should take ten minutes. That's what slow internet feels like. So Mexico is one of my top five favorite countries. I could definitely live in Mexico if a couple things were changed. But the internet in Mexico, last time I went, it's gotten worse. It was so bad. So, like, I can't, I couldn't work or be productive. Well, you know what they're doing, brother? <clears throat> you go into these, like, where we are, you have these little private companies coming in, and they're making this wicked fast internet for a very small space. They put a tower up, and you have this thing on your roof that shoots right to the tower, and it's just bam, bam, bam. <clears throat> because, obviously, as a whole, the internet in Mexico is not reliable, and same with phone service. But when you're <clears throat> on this little private deal, it's much better because I was the same way. I was like, okay, if I'm going to go spend time down there, I need to be able to do what I do. And, you know, through internet, a ton of how I work. So I agree with you. That was one of the things that I was like, shit, I don't know if I can do this, but it's they're they're finding solutions for this stuff. So, you know, if that's something, you know, but you have to come down and check it out sometime, brother. 
Yeah, what city in Mexico do you spend time in? We're actually in San Felipe. <clears throat> I wanted to be able to to drive. After my wrestling career, I had been on airplanes enough, man. I was just to fly to Tokyo for sometimes a weekend. Spend more time on an airplane than on the ground. So I told my wife, I said, look, we're we're gonna get a place we can drive to. So where we are in Southern Cal now, we can get there in about six hours. You know, so <clears throat> but it's uh little you know, San Felipe is right on the Sea of Cortez. So I guess they, they call it Gulf of California, but kind of the same kind of the same thing you're describing with uh, you know, when you were down there and had the slow you couldn't deal with the slow internet. That was one of the challenges I had to overcome before I was gonna buy down there, you know. Mm. Yeah, Amer so Americans don't usually get out to the rest of the world besides Mexico, but we're, we are, as Americans, lucky to have Mexico because Mexico is a great country for freedom. That, that A lot of the freedom that's in Thailand is also in Mexico. It's just that mm. in, in Thailand, I have uh, the culture with dating and women and the religion of Buddhism and the, the, the infrastructure, like the, the transportation and the internet the more high tech culture. Those, those are the, probably the main region reasons. Hey, convenience. Everything's very convenient in, in Thailand and, and uh, they are like health conscious in their own way. So, you know, you go to the Seven Eleven and you can actually eat bodybuilding meal. You can get chicken and rice at the Seven Eleven for practically free. So for the bodybuilding lifestyle, Thailand is, is fantastic. Steroids are, yeah. Not that that was that was that was gonna be my other question. What about the quality of the the steroids out there? Quality of the gear? Because I remember Dennis James back in the days, he actually moved to Thailand to bodybuild. So I was just yeah. wondering, do they have good stuff out there? Yeah, it's like anywhere else. You know, you just mm. there's good stuff and there's bad stuff. But I'd say it's pretty like you just got to know what pharmacies to go to, and then you can pretty much get anything you want for reasonable prices. The main thing is you don't have to worry about it being as illegal. I mean, technically, steroids are pharmaceuticals that you're supposed to have a prescription for, but they're mm. not like recreational drugs that are highly illegal in Thailand. They just don't really care. Steroids mm. never has never killed someone in Thailand. You know, there's never been a serious side effect of, of steroids in Thailand that mm -hmm. has required the government to crack down. So they're just treated like every other pharmaceutical. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. We, we had Chris Bell on the show not too long ago. I know, you know, Chris very well. And he was going through some of the, some of the studies and whatnot, obviously that film bigger, faster, stronger. He was kind of letting us know how, you know, America is, you know, they really demonized uh, the whole use of, especially now with, you know, testosterone replacement clinics are popping up everywhere, but it wasn't very long ago. It was the most demonized thing that was known, you know, seems like of, of all was going on in America. That was what they were. Oh, that was always the fall. That was always the, if there was a problem. It was because of that, you know? Yeah. So. <clears throat> yeah. The, I mean, that, the, re the real reason I think is that testosterone fixes so many health problems that we have mm -hmm. not, I mean, as we age, our testosterone decreases, but also I think there's something suspicious in America decreasing people's testosterone levels. To the point of uh, but just the food alone, the fast, just the processed food and the fast food alone is just crushing people's endocrine systems. Yeah. You know? So when they take testosterone, all of a sudden it cures them of like five diseases that they're experiencing, whether like depression, you know, sleep problems, motivation problems, um, you know, muscle wasting, fat gain. Like there's so many things that come from low testosterone. That's like a foundational thing. One of the first things to look at is your hormone balance. And so if you fix that, then people don't need all these other pharmaceutical medications that are a thousand X markup. So yeah. testosterone is a serious threat to the rest of the pharmaceutical industry. Some people could say, well, testosterone is a pharmaceutical also, but it's a cheap pharmaceutical. It's not a thousand X markup. Mm -hmm. It's not patented yeah. anymore. So yeah. that it does compete. It does compete with the expensive pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. Well, on that level, talk to us and forgive me if I'm incorrect, but I believe you've got a, a clinic, a hormone recla a replacement uh, therapy clinic, correct? Well, I've got, I've got a lot of stuff going on, but right <laughs> as of right now, I don't have a clinic. I had Tony Huge Labs before, had a gym before, had, had a lot of stuff. Right now, I'm focusing more on um, like supplement development, uh, experimenting with the peptides, um, a lot of international stuff. 
I'm working, I'm in the very beginning stages of working on another clinic, building a clinic here in Thailand, uh, which would be like a hormone replacement, anti-aging, like a really yeah, for, high tech clinic. Forgive me, clinic may have been the wrong term, uh, but you, it's from, you know, obviously checking out everything you're doing. It looks like you've got a place where you can actually help people with this stuff. So forgive the term clinic, but you've been really active in, in helping people with this whole thing that we're talking about right. with testosterone testosterone replacement which inevitably is curing all sorts of other uh, other issues you know right yeah so i don't i don't really do i don't do coaching you know and i don't really have clients like that mm -hmm. but i i just help a lot of people and then each person i help is someone i learn from because then they become sort of a guinea pig not that i'm do experimenting on people who aren't willing to experiment but on with you know, <laughs> and all of that. But I get to see how these chemicals react with their body. And then I get to learn from that. So I learn from my own experimentation. And then when I'm interacting with other people or helping other people, I get to learn how their bodies react too. Cause, cause our, each of our bodies can react a little bit different. So to really understand the chemical itself, I got to know how other people's bodies react as well. Yeah. So I do like the rapid transformations where I, where it's hard to do over the internet, but if I'm with someone in person and they're like, I want to build as much muscle as fast as possible, then I like doing really fast blasts, which is kind of the opposite of the rest of, you know, rest of bodybuilding is usually like a slower, safer approach. I like trying to build as much muscle as fast as possible. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard you and other, and I think it was on uh, <clears throat> Mark Bell's podcast, you had explained how it was almost like a series of light switches. You were uh, basically throwing switches. You, you turn a switch on, it gives you a certain effect. You turn a switch off, it gives you a different effect. Talk to us. That was a really interesting way to put it. Uh, talk to us a little bit about that. So I think of, yeah, two different components then. One is the anabolic matrix. That's just a name I gave this list of anabolic pathways like androgen receptor with things like testosterone and growth hormone uh, it would be the next pathway and insulin the next pathway inflammation myostatin so the point of that demonstrative tool is that i i felt like my friends that were bodybuilders were taking too much steroids on the androgen receptor but they weren't giving enough attention to hgh or if they started taking HGH, they weren't taking insulin. And it's like, if they could just put a little bit of attention to these other pathways that are becoming their limiting factors, they could bring their dosages so much further down, or they could keep all the dosages high and just grow really fast with no limiting factors. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, th I thought the biggest misconception in bodybuilding when, it, when people using steroids is that steroids were it when there's so many other different pathways and things that work together with steroids. I mean, steroids is a foundation. It is hard to build muscle without adequate testosterone, as an example. And, but then at a certain point, you take more steroids and it doesn't really do more. But then you start adding these other things in and it starts to do more. Mm -hmm. you know, so that's, that's one element. The, the switches thing is a it's different. That's more like each hormone is like a switch in your cell. And I like to switch the cell one way. And then I like to switch it the other way. So I call it pendulum theory. So the real world practice of this would be instead of doing eight weeks of bulking, I would like to do like one week of bulking and then shift to cutting. And that way we resensitize to the bulking. Our myostatin comes down, our body stops resisting us. The same like carb cycling, except for yeah. I do that with, with like the steroids and the chemistry and everything else is like kind of fits along with the carb cycling approach. What, what are your yeah. views on um, when it comes to basically cycling on and off steroids? Because nowadays you have a new group of so-called bodybuilders that don't get off at all. I think it's like a new trend right now that they're so scared of losing their gains that they would literally stay on cycle all year round. What are your views on that? You know, back, back in America, I everybody was all about cycling because they're trying to, they're saying, okay, I'm going to get muscle. Then I'm going to focus on health mm -hmm. or I'm going to get muscle and then it, I'm going to desensitize to it. And then I'm going to come off. Well, mm -hmm. now we know that if you give attention to enough of the other pathways, you, you'd never have to stop growing. So like, mm -hmm. it's not like we have to come off 
just to be able to grow again. Mm -hmm. If we want to come off for health purposes or just because we built enough muscle and now we just want to maintain it, that's great, right? That, that's mm -hmm. probably the healthiest thing would be to cycle on and off. Mm -hmm. But nobody around me cycles on and off anymore. Everyone around me, like here in Thailand, for example, mm -hmm. everybody is on all the time. Yeah. It's just they drop down to testosterone replacement therapy dosage. Nobody okay. wants to go through PCT because PC, mm -hmm. PCT is like just lost time. Mm -hmm. um, Again, it's fine, especially if you're going to come off for a long period of time, it's worth doing that transition period of PCT. But I think what mm -hmm. most people were doing is like they're going on cycle then they're going on PCT and then they're going right back on cycle. It's like <laughs> if you just stayed on TRT, you would never have that drop and, you know, you'd maintain steady blood levels of testosterone at, a, you know, the healthy levels and you can still detox yourself coming down mm -hmm. to TRT. So that that's the theory. Gotcha. Well, you know, one of the things that I've always thought that was really great about you, brother, as if people that don't know you and listen to you talk, you know, they could they could kind of hear little blips and what people say, just think you're some sort of a mad scientist. But in actuality, all of what you're doing is really to make this more efficient and safer with the use of all this stuff, which I I think that that's missed. Obviously, people need to have take the time to listen to what I have to say, what you have to say. And then they, there's, a, it's a lot more meaningful, not just somebody that's, you know, constantly injecting themselves with different things to see what happens. It's, it's all for the purpose of make it a, making it a, a more effective, but more importantly, a safer journey, you know? And yeah, when it, the but, public, right. I get a lot of hate from the public that I'm advocating mm -hmm. drugs and I'm getting kids on steroids and all this stuff. But the, the people around me who, who get the full story, not just a soundbite, mm -hmm. they all end up adopting all of these philosophies, you know, mm -hmm. because it just, it just makes sense and it's healthy. The drawback of what I do is it's a little bit more complicated. So it's much easier to follow a cycle where you've made, you do the same thing for eight weeks, you know, mm -hmm. your diet, your training, everything, everything's consistent. So you can really see how your body reacts. You know what to expect. So there's definitely a place for that. I don't, I don't disagree with that, with that approach. It's just that, yeah, I think if we are willing to put a little bit more attention to it and experiment a little bit, I think mm -hmm. we can do it faster and even safer, but it does mm -hmm. take more attention. You have to, mm -hmm. you know, it takes more thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously a lot of knowledge, <clears throat> you know, you're, you're a very, very smart guy. And with your application and all this, I mean, you're really kind of you're pretty, you're, you're really ahead of the game in terms of what most people even think is possible in terms of using these different compounds safely, which that's one thing I've always really respected about you. I mean, the fact that you were a lawyer to begin with, that will add credibility alone. Most people don't know that. Like I said, it's just a, you know, people are real quick to look at a, a, a page in social media and draw a conclusion, not really looking at what's going on, you know, so you know, the, the, your, your smarts and the way that you talk about things adds a lot of credibility. And I, you know, personally, I love to hear you talk about things because you do create perspectives. Like you said in the beginning, too many people look at what they're doing in, in like, a, like a too narrow of, of a perspective. When you open it up, you start to see a lot more. And I think that's, you know, getting people thinking, I think that's one of the great things that you do and you bring to the table. So I, I, my hat's off to you for that, brother. You know, yeah, this is the fight for freedom. The more people <clears throat> that embrace using chemistry and do it safer, the more advocates we'll have out there. You know, like like if 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 the democracy still exists mm -hmm. and a bill gets proposed that even limits our access to chemistry even more, you guys are going to vote against it because you guys True. are using the chemistry and you, mm -hmm. you realize the value of it. And so the more people that are using the chemistry responsibly and find it benefits their life, then maybe maybe if there is any democracy left, then maybe we can kind of swing it the other way towards freedom instead of control. Yeah. yeah. It's one thing that I've always uh, been, you know, I, I don't agree with, like you look like countries like England, countries like Canada, you know, if you're using it as far as a recreational use, you know, like some like steroids and stuff like that, and you're not having, you don't have intent to sell, it, it's not illegal, you know? You could have a certain amount of quantities in, in England or in Canada, and as long as you're not trying to sell, but then you look at something like, you know, someplace like the U.S. where, you know, we, we all preach about democracy and freedom and stuff like that. 
And even if you're just using it for personal use, you know, it's illegal substance. So I never agreed with that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, America's ground zero for the pharmaceutical, for the most powerful pharmaceutical companies. Yeah. You can see how all the, the laws first come to America and then they permeate the rest of the world. So we just hope that, that it, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't carry over. You, you, have other, you have other countries that have totally legalized everything. There's no problems. Yeah. And then you have yeah. other countries that made it made steroids so illegal that if they think you have too much muscle, they can come to your house and they can even. blood and urine test you and yeah. put you yeah. in prison for mm -hmm. even having metabolites of steroids that you did a long mm -hmm. time ago. Mm -hmm. Crazy. Yeah. <clears throat> so quick shift of gears, brother. And <clears throat> obviously, it could be a, this may be a topic that you, you can limit what you say. Uh, but I know that part of you, you, you had said in. I can't remember I had, <clears throat> I had seen you say this, but you said living in Thailand, doing what you do, it's easier with the laws. Now, I, I, I think that may lead back to you having some conflict with, a, a, with an American law or, you know, <laughs> talk to us as much as you can. Talk to us about that. I'm trying to gently ease into the topic. So with the enhanced brand and the enhanced movement. Uh, years ago, it, 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 the company blew up really fast. The movement blew up really fast. And uh, it got to the point where it was threatening some of the major monopolies in the industry, mainstream medical, um, the mainstream supplement industry. And so there was a, a conspiracy. I mean, like we, we, we think conspiracy means fake, but in this case, it was a conspiracy of uh, various different companies and special interests that got together that said, let's eliminate Tony Huge, let's eliminate the enhanced movement, it's now posing a threat. So there was a, yeah, there was a lawsuit about it that was tied into it. There was government investigations, uh, the governments of the US government raided a facility and took everything, then the uh, government in England raided a facility, took everything. Government in Australia raided the facility, took everything. So they really tried to, they, 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 they took the domain name, but a hacker was able to get it back. Uh, I mean, the government wow. and these other entities came at it to try to, you know, you see this kind of happen with, with some of the conservative political speakers and you see them get deplatformed. So mm -hmm. I, I got deplatformed off of every platform, everything deleted, wiped out. And the government, the U S government was, was part of this. So I, I specifically, I wasn't making any money from all of it. I was, uh, I was just as retired as a lawyer off of my, off of my money from that and other things. So I didn't go to prison. My, uh, my, my, a friend of mine and who was the CEO of Enhanced went to prison for two years. He's out now. So yeah, they came, they came at it pretty hard. And, I, and a lot of people warned me too, when I was, when, when everything was growing so fast, they warned like you are a serious threat to uh, certain monopolies and they will take you out. Like, and, and I thought maybe there was going to be an opportunity to, fight in the public eye and win the public over. I thought maybe it was going to be a media battle that I could win. So I didn't this realize back to you and free. This is going back to freedom for you. Literally. Yeah. I didn't realize they were going to freeze wow. my bank accounts mm -hmm. and uh, my take the social media accounts, take the website. I mean, life is life now is transitioning to a digital world. If the government can come in and eliminate you digitally, they, that's pretty much like killing you in a way. I mean, especially as we shift to the metaverse, imagine in the metaverse, you know, right now your feet are maybe like 20% in technology, 80% out. Imagine as the metaverse yeah. transitions and you're 80% in the technology and 20% out. If they wipe out your technology, they've wiped out 80% of your life. They've 80% murdered you. The government has that power with yeah. the flip of a switch. That's where yeah. we're going. So I experienced yeah. all that to further than any further. People just can't even imagine the power that these entities have over you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's, that's what happened. Now I'm, I'm not fleeing from, I'm not a, I'm, there's no criminal case against me or there's no, there's no civil case against me. 
There's no reason I can't be in America. The problem is if I'm in America, then I catch the interest of all these different entities because I'm sort of directly competing with them again. If I'm outside of America, I'm just less of a, a concern. Right. Like yeah. I'm not, I know that I can't take on these guys head on anymore. All I can do is try to help educate people and make people aware of how it works. And I, like, I mean, this is like, this is like a Larry Flint of the fitness world, brother. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, 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 yeah. Right. <laughs> Because I mean, literally, you're you're fighting for the freedom of what you feel that you should be able to do, and obviously, if you know the the powers that be don't like that, they do everything they can to disrail to derail you. And obviously, mm-hmm. you you were hoping that you could take it to a public forum, and and obviously, it didn't work out. But it, that's I mean, that's crazy. That's 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 I mean, this whole thing for you literally boils down to freedom, one hundred percent. This is this is really inspiring, brother. Yeah, you can't, you, you'd think like, why can't we just take this to a public forum? Why can't we just debate these things uh, in the mainstream media? But if you look at what's happening right now with the virus, you know, you, you can't debate that. You can't question that. You, I, I tried. I got censored dirt with that also. I would have loved to have been, been an advocate and really help bring all of the actual scientific information forward instead of the, the politics. Uh, for that situation, but I I went down that path a little bit and I got censored again. So mm. they deleted my Instagram. My Instagram had 150,000 subscribers, and I was just speaking facts about the virus and and uh, you know still about steroids and chemistry in general. But I'm I'm just telling just talking facts, and uh, they took my Instagram. That was like six months ago now. So I had to build a the new the Instagram you see right now is only. It was a backup account. I've had backup accounts for everything. So I shift to a backup account, but I, I get up to 100,000, 150,000 subscribers on any one platform. And then they find something that I violate their terms by promoting dangerous information by telling scientific facts and then delete them. Mm. So still mm. dealing with it outside of the US. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'll tell you, brother, for, for people that are watching this that don't know you, <clears throat> this is, I mean, it's just un- uncovering a side that is, I mean, I love you. You opened up, first thing out of your mouth was freedom. And it's been this whole conversation, if you look deep enough, is going back to a person's freedom to do as they choose, which is, like I said, pretty inspiring. Granted, your platform has been obviously pretty racy and it gets you a lot of heat. But, you know, hell, I mean, anybody that brings something, you know, to the forefront that's against the powers that be, that's the way it's going to be, you know, that's, that's, it's pretty, it's, you know, again, it, it's inspiring to see someone fighting the fight and fighting for what they believe in, even when it's uphill, you know, I, I, yeah, I, I think it's it. I think it's interesting that you you know you still keep going and you haven't quit because most people get into a situation like <laughs> that, you know, they, they stay away. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> I try. I wake up in the morning and I'm like, do I really need to to do can I just be a private person and just enjoy life? Yeah. But but I see I see what's happening. It um the the restrictions on freedom just keep growing more and more and people don't people just don't see the big picture of where this is going. They're focused on like food, putting food on the table and satisfying their needs and the pleasure of that day. And they're not realizing like behind the scenes, what society is going to be in 10 years, it's not going to be a mm-hmm. pretty place. And, and so we can't stop the progress of human evolution and the fusion of technology and the elimination of freedom. It, it'll happen eventually, but we can slow it down. Mm-hmm. Uh, I tell you, brother, this has been this has been really cool stuff. And I got told Nick before he left, you're going to be a two part guy for sure. So, sure. What a, <laughs> but uh, so on that level, we've been on for a little more than an hour. We appreciate your time. I still got a couple more questions for us. I know they're going to be very interesting answers that they all have been. Um, if you could jump at a time capsule <clears throat> and go back into your life, number one, how far would you go back to what age and what would you tell yourself? I would go back to age 21 and tell myself to start steroids. I started too late. I started when I was 30 and I wasted nine years of my life as a natty, not making any progress because I already reached my plateau. And uh, 
when you're younger like that, you know, you can put on a lot of muscle and it's not going to burden your health so much. Now I'm 39 years old and I'm thinking, you know, I was 236 pounds before. No, I've never a mass muscle, but that's pretty big. I mean, I was, yeah, I was, you know, bodybuilder big. And, uh, I, I, I worry that if I do that again, like my heart can't handle it, you know, and, uh, that my body just can't handle it. I'm only two, I'm only two eighteen right now. Right. Um, but I, I just worry that, that I missed my opportunity to get massive. I would have loved to have gotten massive when I'm younger and not just that, but just to make progress and not be wasting my time in the gym. So like there's this, there's a lot of people out there saying, you know, people shouldn't start steroids until much, much later. And kind of like, we have to say that, right. We, we, <laughs> because of the way society is, we have to say, yeah. stuff like that. but yeah. the truth is for me personally, I wish I started younger and I wish I got huge when I was younger. Not that I had to maintain it all the time, but I wish I would check, check that off my box. Like get, get to 250 pounds at 8% body fat. And uh, like a, like a real bodybuilder, 510 uh, back then, while I could, while it, while you're younger and while, while it's easier. Yeah. Would there have been any, any discussion with you and the young version of yourself about your, your fight for freedom? Yeah. So in, in America, not every country is like this, but in America, everything is on like long-term contract, uh, you know, kind of lock you in like your cell phone plan wants to lock you in for two years, you know, and put you on a payment plan for your phone, your car, your car payment wants to lock you in and your, your rental contract with your, your house is, is like a year contract or whatever. Everything's like contract kind of lock you in uh, marriage is a contract, children are a contract. And so as you get, as you go through life, you start accumulating what could be considered liabilities or, or commitments that kind of box you in and narrow what you could do in the future. And that could be all fine if that's exactly where you want to go. But sometimes you change. Sometimes as you get older, you change and you want different things. And, you know, like you, you bought a car and you got this payment and you're stuck with that car. I mean, yes, you could sell it and, and all that, but it's not, not everything's easy to get out of. So it would have been to advising myself to be really careful what I commit myself to like really think, is that something that I, even as I change and as I get older, is that something I'm going to be want, want to be involved with, especially uh -huh. when it comes to like marriage and, and, and children and things like that. Although I, I was good. I didn't get married and I didn't have children until accidentally later after I had my career and all that, but just other commitments, just anything that was a commitment along the way. And I probably would have told myself just based on my person and who I am that um, I would have told myself that the freedom that you think is in America is a little bit of an illusion that it's going to feel like freedom. It really will feel like freedom up until a certain point. And then you hit a glass wall and you realize the glass wall was always there. You just didn't see it because you didn't run into it. So I, I would have told myself to explore other countries where there aren't as many glass walls and, and see if I could be happy in another country, if that'd be more conducive to, and also with relationships, like the American culture for relationships just isn't for me. There's, there's a lot of other countries that I like the style of relationships. Thailand is just one of them, but I would have told myself to go experience relationships in other places, not, not try so hard to, to fight an uphill battle looking for the right type of relationship for me in America when the right type of relationship for me is like easy, low hanging fruit in so many other places. So I think just because we're born into one culture doesn't mean that's necessarily the optimal culture for us to thrive in. So I would have told myself to experience more, more cultures so that I could decide at a younger age before I committed, made a lot of long-term commitments in America. Because once I decided when I was 30 years old, also that I, I started feeling like, wow, maybe I would want to live somewhere else. I was like, wow, I've got a house. I've got boats, jet skis, cars, motorcycles, commitments, a law firm with thousands of clients, employees that depend on me. Like it took me, it took me three years of work to be able to just shed the obligations to move three years. Uh, right. Yeah. So that, yeah. that's been my advice to freedom. Yeah. That's, that's interesting because it's, it's very true. You know, we tie ourselves into commitments that are, 
you know, it's, it's not easy to just pick up and, and make a change or pick up and go somewhere if that's what you want to do. Right. So, yeah, very, very interesting perspective. I love it. I love it. So clearly you're, you're making a, a big impact on the world for sure. I mean, goodness, the stuff that you just explained to us is kind of mind blowing. What are you, what do you want to leave behind when Tony Hughes is gone? What is it that you want to be remembered for? I think it's really rewarding to me when, I mean, some people would think this is a terrible thing, but it's really rewarding to me when someone comes up to me and said, like, I did my first steroid cycle because of you. And it's the best choice I ever made. You know, that type of thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, oh. I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to put people's health in jeopardy and I, I don't, I'm not trying, I don't want people to get hurt and all that. But just the truth is that, most people aren't allowed to say because of sponsorships, because of community, because of the internet, they're not allowed to say stuff like this, but I'll say that, you know, behind the scenes, when I talk to bodybuilders um, and, and not just bodybuilders, but people who use steroids or chemistry to enhance their quality of life, they're all just, uh, they all just wish they knew about it earlier. They wish they knew how to use it properly earlier it's been a tremendous benefit to their life. And they, they, a lot of, some people want to keep it a secret because they don't, you know, they don't want other people to know what their secret is that thing. And that they have like the fake natties, you know, on Instagram type of stuff, that, which is, which is hilarious, which is fun <laughs> and fine. Uh, but a lot of people would love to be able to talk openly about it. They just can not because of society mm-hmm. and, and sponsorships and their job and, and everything else. So, I'm grateful that I'm able to, I, I have nobody controlling me. I can say whatever I want. And um, I, I think I, I almost have a duty to use that because not a lot of people in that position. I have a duty to use that. And so my legacy would be that I was able to say what a lot of people wanted to say, but couldn't. So it's, I mean, the difference is other people would say, a lot of people would say it if they could, they just couldn't. I can, so I should, so I do. And so I, I, uh, I like to be sort of a hero for those of us who would like to break the taboo against steroids so that we're not looked at as, as a negative thing for using it. You know, like like the, public, the public looking at us bodybuilders and go, oh, steroids, like as, an, as a negative thing. Instead be like, ah, oh, steroids. Like this guy knows how to manipulate his bodybuilding chemistry. This guy is a pioneer of human evolution. You know, this guy, this guy actually created something and Mm -hmm. and challenged nature, you know, superseded nature as a positive thing. Brother, you've had so much, so many interesting things to say. I I got a confession to make here. So about 15 minutes ago, um, I mean, every year you're in the middle of one of your spiels, everyone's going so well. And I I mean, it's such great conversation. I had to take a piss. And I take a piss so badly. I don't know if you saw that water bottle. I took that bottle and I tried to piss down <laughs> the bottle. And uh, I'd, say, I'd say about half, about half of my piss went on the floor and on my pants. But I'm oh, glad that I God. did it. Thank God I'm in uh, my fucking garage because it's the <laughs> night floor. <laughs> oh, oh John. Uh. I mean, that, that, that may be the greatest compliment I've ever had. <laughs> well, you I take that to hear what you I were, heard. You, you were just, you were on such a roll. I thought, I, there's no way I can stop this and say, I got to go to the bathroom real quick. So I took, you see me drinking out of that bottle. Well, shit, it's changed colors and it's, it filled itself back up pretty good. You know? Oh, wow. <laughs> hey, that that's worth a lot of money. I think that's some really <laughs> urine right there. But that's that right there, you know. When 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 someone is is dropping pearls and inspiring about freedom, sometimes you just got a little bit of piss on the floor, a little bit of piss in the bottle, a little bit of piss in your pants. It was all for you, my brother. <laughs> Thank you, John. Amazing compliment. <laughs> oh, well, that's gonna wrap us up here. No, John, you John, you John. no man, you're one of a kind, John. <laughs> Well, you know, there's something about, you know, 
you just got to fucking lay it on the on the line because look, yeah, we yeah. all fucking pee. We've all pissed in our pants. I've pissed in my pants more times than I can count from the time I was born until hell. I'm 50 years old and I just pissed in my pants again trying to piss in a bottle, but it's facts, you know. You know, it fits so like that, that's that situation just fits so good in with how you talk to about like being hardcore and taking life and getting it done. It's like, you got to piss in a bottle, but you piss in a bottle. <laughs> so, I mean, I was, I was thinking to myself, God, I was just going to try to leak a little bit out just to relieve some pressure. <laughs> and it was like, it was like, fuck, man, I just, I, I can't stop it. You know, it's coming. You got you to gotta go, John, you got to go, you got to go, right? Fuck, and I didn't have a good enough hold on the bottle, so as it got heavier, I lost grip on it, changed angle. Next thing you know, it's going on the fucking floor. So, you know, I got I got flip flops on, thank God, and I got a cement floor. So, but again, brother, all for you because I wasn't gonna fucking break the stride that you were in. That was good shit. So, awesome. thanks, John. Thanks, Akeem. <laughs> <laughs> <You're welcome. laughs> all right well that's it that's it that's round one because we're definitely bringing you back for round two brother Ak, you got anything else for tony before we no nah, man we sign it, off it's been very entertaining and you know i, I love the way you think and uh, you know i wish you all the best out there in thailand and uh just keep killing it man you're an amazing person yeah all right thanks I, guys look forward to and talking. on that level you know everybody that's watching you know really hear his message i mean this is a guy who's fighting for freedom not just his own he's fighting for everyone's freedom and and that you know that speaks about a person's character look at all the trouble he's gone through and he's still fighting the fight so for that my brother my hat is off to you i can't wait to have you back the next time we have you on the show it's going to be awesome i'm going to make sure that i take a piss just seconds before we start so i don't have to pee in a bottle a second time but uh, that being said that's that's another edition of Legends of Iron. We're here to inspire our listeners. We're here to make you the best version of yourself. That's Tony Huge. We will see you guys next time. Legends of Iron is brought to you by Muscleman, the creator of Nitro Test. Nitro Test is hands down the most fucking kick-ass free workout on the market. If you fucking want some, come fucking get some. Can you handle it?